This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scary to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. You guys, I got so many beautiful emails from you after last week. I appreciate it so, so much. I think I was dealing with a little bit of imposter syndrome, and I've talked through it with some amazing online friends of mine. By the way, don't ever let anyone tell you that online friends aren't real friends because my online friends have been some of the best people I've ever met. I've also been fortunate enough to actually meet some of them in real life as well and I just feel so lucky for that. I hope you're having a good week. I hope right now you're relaxing after work or lying in bed about to go to sleep. I have some great stories for you this week from two brand new authors to the show. Both of them are fantastic writers, and I hope that they'll have more for me to share with you in the future. I received more submissions than usual after last week, and that makes me so happy. Remember, don't be scared. Feel free to email your story to scarytosleep at gmail.com. Before we begin, just a quick note. The new deadline for kids and teens submissions for their respective Halloween specials is September 22nd. So you have a couple of weeks to come up with something fun and scary. The first story this week is sure to get your skin crawling. Author Richard Kenway brings you The Hoppers. I'm writing this for two reasons. First, in case I don't make it, and secondly, to say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for causing this. Well, that's not entirely accurate. I guess the truth would be that I I let this happen. So how did this all start? I live in a small town in southern England with my wife and two children. We wanted to get a pet for the household, but not a usual pet. After doing some research, we found a cute-looking bearded dragon in our local pet store. Our children fell in love with him instantly. He was quirky and would run across the vivarium and in front of the glass, much to the kids' amusement. We named him Moto, as in Komodo Dragon. I thought it was a clever name, and it suited him. Moto's diet consisted of these tiny insects called hoppers. They varied in size based on the age of your pet. When Moto was little, so was his food. It was fun to watch him chase down these tiny grasshopper-like insects and devour them. As he grew larger, so too did his food. It was around the time that he moved on to stage 5 hoppers that the problem started. These things were pretty big, but at his age, Moto was now eating other forms of food as well. He liked kale and diced up carrots. We tried him on squash, but... He didn't like it very much, and given the choice, he always preferred hoppers. You can't substitute vegetables for a nice big juicy hopper. That's like choosing between Brussels sprouts and a large cheeseburger. There's no comparison. The other good thing is that Moto didn't eat very much once he got quite big. This meant we could go out again on weekends. You see, when he was little, we had to feed him three times a day. I took the family out to a fair that had been set up a few miles away. It was your typical Sunday marketplace with stalls selling various items like handmade dream catchers and candy floss, where you paid five pounds for your child to spend five minutes on a bouncy castle, then had to wrestle them off when their time was up. As we were walking around, we happened upon a stall selling pet accessories and food. I was amazed to see that there were hoppers for sale and they were going quite cheap too. We did need some more hoppers at home, and I jumped at what I thought was a great bargain. When we got a bag, I gave a few to Moto, who gobbled them up rather appreciatively. 
I left the box on top of the vivarium and went about the rest of my Sunday, which for me meant washing the car and watching the moto racing on the telly. It was the next evening when I returned from work that we got our first clue that something wasn't entirely normal. I just wish we had noticed at the time. I guess hindsight's a bitch like that. My wife picked up the container with the hoppers inside and examined its contents. I thought you fed Moto yesterday, she said. Not a dig, but more of a curiosity. I did. How come? I replied. There just seems to be more in here, she replied. I went over for a look, and it did appear that there were more in the box than yesterday. I convinced myself that it was my imagination, that there was more in the box than I realized. I shrugged it off and gave Moto his dinner for the evening, and we left it at that. The following day, however, we were shocked to discover that the box containing the hoppers was now crammed full of tiny insects. The box was so full that they were pressed up against the sides. It didn't seem possible. Did they all breed overnight or something? From a financial perspective, this was fantastic. A food source that kept replenishing itself. Great news, we would never have to buy food for Moto again. That evening, we treated Moto to an extra large meal and figured anything he didn't eat would be there for him the following day. We also painstakingly transferred some of the hoppers to another container so they wouldn't be so crammed. Have you ever tried to transport 50 jumping insects from one tub to another at the same time? It's not easy, I can tell you. We left Moto to his midnight feast and went to bed. The next morning, my wife woke me and pulled me downstairs. She sounded anxious and very concerned. I, on the other hand, was more upset about being woken up a whole hour before my alarm was supposed to. What is the matter? I asked as she pulled me down the stairs. She pointed at Moto's vivarium, and I immediately saw what all the fuss was about. The place was full of hoppers. They were everywhere, crawling up the sides on the glass over Moto himself, who wasn't looking very happy about this. These hoppers weren't just breeding, they were multiplying, and very quickly from the looks of it. I checked the containers, they were both full to the brim with hoppers, busting at the seams. Even the top was bulging slightly. My wife was starting to panic, stating that it wasn't normal and that we should call someone. I foolishly told her not to panic, and that we would figure something out that evening. That evening, I finished work later than usual. When I got home, I was greeted by two crying children and a frantic wife. Before I could even begin to ask what happened, my wife uttered, two words to me. Moto's dead, she said. I rushed over to the vivarium and looked inside. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Moto was curled up in the middle of his vivarium, and the hoppers, they were eating him. I mean, completely devouring him. There was almost nothing left of him. Now I was beginning to panic, but it was late and everyone was kind of hysterical. We spent some time getting the kids to sleep because they were so upset. I came downstairs and emptied the hoppers into the vivarium to stop them from escaping. There were hundreds of them, all jumping all over the place. I laid in bed wondering if I was ever going to drop off to sleep. I must have done because I woke up to my wife, screaming. I bolted out of bed and ran out the bedroom door and down the stairs where I stopped dead at the sight of the lounge. Hoppers everywhere. On the furniture, the television, they were climbing the neck curtains and some were even on the ceiling. I looked at the vivarium wondering how the hell they got out and saw the hole in the side. They had eaten their way through the solid wood. I called our local pet shop and tried to explain what was happening, but they just laughed at me. 
I can't blame them. It, it sounded ridiculous. I got everyone out of the room and sprayed it full of wasp and fly killer, hoping it would have the same effect on the insects. I called in sick to work that day. We dropped the kids off at school, then returned to find thousands of dead hoppers on the floor. We spent hours hoovering them up and scooping them up with a dustpan and a brush. We filled bin bags full of them. I thought the ordeal was over. I was... wrong. It was the middle of the night when my wife shook me awake. There was a noise coming from out in the hallway. A crawling noise like thousands of tiny legs walking over the bedroom door. I turned my bedside light on and ran to the door. The hallway was full of hoppers. And I mean full We could barely see the carpet. There were so many. I ran into our first child's room and turned the light on. I wish I hadn't. The hoppers had eaten her in her sleep. My wife screamed behind me and I followed her into our second child's room to see... He had suffered the same fate, eaten right down to the bone. I turned and threw up in the hallway whilst my wife ran into the room and (coughs) began swatting the insects. They must have felt threatened or something because, like a wave, they all washed over her. She was swinging at them and trying to get them off. I tried to help her, but the the hoppers were turning on me as well. I shook them off and tried to reach my wife who had now fallen on the ground and was buried under the swarming insects. I retreated to the bathroom, leaving my wife to be eaten alive next to the body of our son. That was three days ago. I'm still in the bathroom writing this down on an old crossword puzzle book that I left beside the toilet. I rolled up a towel and soaked it in bleach to try to keep them from coming under the door. It it seems to be working. They haven't tried to get in, as far as I can tell. I can hear helicopters flying overhead. They appear to be dropping something over us. Pesticides, maybe. I wonder how many people had to die before the alert was made. Oh god. I can hear scratching above me. I think they're coming in through the ceiling. To anyone who reads this. I am so, so sorry. You guys know every once in a while I like to plug other podcasts just because I think that you would love them and I love spreading the word. So here I am. I want to tell you guys about West Side Fairy Tales. From hostile alien worlds where creeping red fungus drives men to madness to the simple insanities of living an unfulfilling domestic life, West Side Fairy Tales has a horror story just for you. If you like the tone of my show, then I promise you'll love West Side Fairy Tales, seriously. They're coming back for their fourth season on October 4th, so you have plenty of time to binge seasons one through three. It was created by host Tyler Bell, and it comes out on the first Friday of every month. And if you want to know more, you can visit westsidefairytales.com. But you know what? Talk is cheap. So here's a promo for you to really hear what I'm talking about. Why would you trade for freedom, for glory, for happiness? The Internet's Scariest Horror Dark Fiction Podcast returns October 4th. I think you would study yourself. Journey to the shaded hills of West Virginia, the agave fields of the Guadalajara countryside, and the remote reaches of space for ten new stories of horrid sacrifice, self-destruction, 
and madness. You seem like the type to do anything. Tune in the first Friday of every month and see if you're brave enough to handle the West Side Fairy Tales. Available everywhere you listen to podcasts. You would bring me hearts. Learn more at westsidefairytales.com. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is Rocket Money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Our last story of the night is beautiful and intense, and it gets very dark in a real way. So, just a quick trigger warning for mentions of self-harm and depression. Author Brianna Von Reet brings you Unseen. I noticed this morning that my hair is thinning. There are strands on my pillow and in the sink on the bathroom floor. I'm sure that if I showered today, the drain would be full and I use that as an excuse to skip it. I've been finding them lately in my various takeout orders as well, but it's easy to convince myself that those aren't mine. Wrinkle my nose as I pull them from my noodles or pizza. I'm sitting in front of my computer streaming an old television series while a new document sits untouched on another tab. I have a deadline to meet. But I also know that I should try to leave my stuffy apartment today. Force some human interaction. In the end, the struggle between fresh air and work is too overwhelming, and I do neither. I finish the season I'm watching. Move on to the next. Order and tie for dinner. I'll write tomorrow. I wake late in the morning stray hairs tangled in my mouth like dirty floss I try to scratch an itch on my nose pull my hand away see that the nail of my index finger is missing the skin is smooth and round as if it never held a nail bed at all I blink Stare at it for a moment. Try to feel concern. There's movement in the corner of my eye. Did something just move under my dresser? I pull my covers up onto my face and go back to sleep. The phone wakes me from my doze. My mother. Did I wake you? It's 3.45. 
No, I lie. Were you working? Yes, I lie. How about dinner tomorrow? Your sister wants to go to a movie in the evening and has asked for an earlier reservation. Is 5.30 okay for you? Dinner? Her birthday. You didn't forget, did you? No. Another lie. 5.30 is fine, Mom. Are you alright? Feeling okay? I'm fine. Lie. You sure? I'm tired. Truth. I'm searching through the pile of clothes in the corner of my room for something clean enough to wear to dinner. When I notice another nail is missing. The thumb of the other hand. The left, I stare at it for a moment. Try to give it importance, but I can't. I keep searching through the pile. I pull at a pair of dark jeans and something scurries out from underneath the tangle of laundry, startling me. I fall back onto my hands and shuffle backwards towards my bed, eyes locked on the thing under my dresser. Is it a mouse? I can't tell through the shadows. I wouldn't be surprised if this old building had mice, and I haven't exactly been tidy this past year or so. I give it a few moments to move again. When it doesn't, I go to the hallway closet and grab a flashlight. Get on my hands and knees, a few feet away from the dresser, shine the light back and forth. No mouse. Nothing but stray socks, a wadded tissue, drifts of my hair. Was it my imagination? It sure looked big for a mouse. 4 p.m., I'm in the bathroom wearing my semi-clean dark jeans and a gray sweater. I put a bit of makeup on, deodorant. I think I'm fine without a shower. My hair up in a messy bun that will pass as fashionable. I look at myself in the mirror as I brush my teeth. Were my eyes always gray? I can't remember. I think maybe they were brown. I lean over the sink. Spit. Something hits the porcelain with an audible clink. A tooth, there in the sink, immersed in a foamy puddle of toothpaste. I feel around inside of my mouth with my tongue. There, the first bottom molar on the left side. Is it noticeable? I pick the tooth out, rinse it off, put it next to the faucet. Rinse spit. Open my mouth for a look in the mirror. It's not so bad. I don't think it's obvious unless I open my mouth wide. I head to the living room, sit on the couch with my laptop across my legs, and try to do some work before I leave. I'm maybe 20 minutes late. My family smiles exaggeratedly when they see me stand up from their seats at the table eyes flick over me quick as insect wings we hug I've said happy birthday to my sister before I realize I have no gift no card I forgot it I lie I'm sorry she smiles no big deal she's 16 So sweet. The best person I know. I'll pick her up something special and bring it by the house. I won't forget. They ask me about my work. My social life. I steer the conversation back to her. It's her birthday. Her celebration. I'm unimportant. It's nice to be out. 
The food is good. Better than takeout. I drink too much wine and my eyes get a little misty. Feels good to be with my family. My dad drives me home. Helps me get into my apartment. I consider telling him about the mouse, but I don't. He hugs me. Tells me he loves me. To call soon. I shut the door. I cry for a bit. Fall asleep on the couch in my clothes. It was a nice night. I wake up groggy, sore. Leave a tuft of hair on the couch cushion. I cough. A tooth falls into my palm. I put it on the coffee table and will myself into the bathroom where I run the tap. Drink cold water from the faucet. Splash my face and use my sweater as a towel before looking into the mirror. My face is hollow. Sunken. My eyes look even lighter in color. My front right tooth is missing. Making me look like an emaciated hockey player. I stumble into my bedroom. Ignore the movement in the corner and fall into bed. I pull the stale sheets over my head. I don't dream. My empty stomach wakes me with a cramp and I have no idea how long I've been asleep. The sheet is still over my face. I'm hot. My stomach growls and I pull the sheet down and lift my sweater. Run my hands over my grayish skin. My normally soft stomach is concave. My ribs standing out beneath my papery looking flesh. I pull my sweater back down and get out of bed. Walk to the fridge to take a cardboard dry slice of pizza from the grease stained box on the shelf. I take two bites and feel ill. Pizza goes into the bin. Another tooth embedded in the cold, congealed cheese. I walk to the sink and look at the rivulets of rain that run down the glass of the kitchen window. Trace drops from the top of the pane to the bottom. As they meet and join, become swollen and heavy as they make their final dash to the peeling paint of the window pane. I wonder how, with my own body becoming lighter every day, I continue to feel heavier. There's a sound behind me, a quick, whispery shuffle. It sounds much bigger than a mouse. Another sound. A voice. It sounds wrong, quiet, insubstantial. I can't tell whether it's in my ears or in my head. I don't turn around. I feel numb, neither afraid nor particularly curious. There's the voice again. Slightly louder, but still hard to make out. I sink down to the kitchen floor. Draw my knees to my chest and close my eyes. I'm not sure how long I sit there, dozing, before it speaks again. But I hear it more clearly this time. I think it says, Enough. I'm so tired. I'll just stay like this for a while. My phone is vibrating somewhere as I fall asleep on the floor. Back in the bathroom, naked now, I examine myself in the harsh light. I have seven nails left. Four on my hands and three on my feet. I see my ribs clearly, but some appear to be missing. I've lost nearly half of my teeth, 
But there is no pain in any particular area of my body. Just a general, exhausting ache. I'm leery of letting my hair down from the bun it's been knotted in for days. But I'm also a bit curious to see how much I have left. I can see my bedroom doorway behind me through the mirror. Something moves, stands part way into my line of vision. It's tiny, baby sized, but roughly human shaped. It's hard to make out in the poor evening light. What do you want? I ask it. It moves back into the bedroom, but I can hear its reply. Quiet, it says. I sit with my computer in my lap wearing underwear and a t-shirt that I now swim in. I try to work because I don't know what else to do with myself, but I can hardly remember what I'm supposed to be writing about. My phone buzzes on the table. Another message from my mother. If you don't call me, I am calling the police. I am serious. The phone rings. I answer. I have been calling and messaging for two days. Your sister's been trying you as well. What is going on with you? Nothing, Mom, I say, trying to speak normally around my missing teeth and glancing towards my bedroom door. Something is wrong. I wish you would talk to me. You've been so distant since... I'm fine. I interject. No, you're not. I'm coming over. I'll bring you some groceries. I glance to my room again, to the tiny thing, standing against the wall in the dimness. Don't, I say. I'll come to your house. I could use some air. I should get out of the apartment for a bit. Silence for a moment. Okay. Drive carefully, it's pouring. See you soon. Dressing is difficult, because none of my pants fit me. Leggings and an oversized hoodie work alright. They also hide how thin I've become. It's crazy, going over there looking like this. They'll hospitalize me. I neither dread nor find relief in the thought. I feel like an outsider, simply interested to see what will happen, what their reactions will be when they see me. I grab my keys and leave without looking back into the bedroom, but I feel a gaze on my back as I walk out the door. I stand in the rain on the steps of the house I grew up in. I haven't been here for months and the sight of it makes me almost unbearably sad. I give myself a moment to feel it. The rain. The sadness. The first real things I felt in what seems like a very long time. I feel cleansed by the rain. There's a tickle of something that feels like hope. I'm ready to accept their help. Brace myself for the reactions. I knock. I don't say much as I sit in the living room with my mother and sister. A bag of tortilla chips and a bowl of seven-layer dip on the table between us. I don't know what to say. I'm in shock. I feel a bit like I'm losing my mind. They speak to me with utter normalcy. My mother gently prodding, asking me what's been going on lately, how I'm feeling, sleeping. They really don't see what's happening to me? This depleted wreck of a person right in front of them? Part of me wants to scream, look at me! I'm falling apart! I fidget my bare fingers, 
twist full locks of my hair from my head and let them drift to the carpet. Nothing. I have no words for my mother's questions, so I tell her what I think she wants to hear, in the hopes that she'll stop poking, needling with words of her own that don't even touch the surface of what's happening to me. My sister seems to see a little. Her glances show concern that she doesn't vocalize. I can't stand it. This tiptoeing around me that's been going on for ages now. I want to get out of this house. I'm under a lot of stress with work, I say. Riding is hard right now. I'm having a block. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine, I say because I can't make them see that I'm not. She brings you up. Tries to talk about you. And I tell them I have to leave now. I'm meeting someone for dinner. She says she hopes I plan to brush my hair first, and I almost scream with hysterical laughter, barely managing to push it down. We hug. I wait a beat for either of them to remark on my size. They don't. I leave. I drink warm water from the tap for dinner, swallowing a tooth in the process. My eyes are almost completely white now, the pupils standing out in stark relief. My bun fell off along with most of my hair shortly after I got home. I wasn't sure what to do with it, this tangled clump of my cells. So I left it on the floor. It didn't lay there long before the thing in my bedroom, now toddler size, skittered across the hardwood and snatched it up, scurrying under my bed with its prize. I sit on the bathroom floor. I don't know for how long. The ache in my body is stronger. I hurt. Droplets fall to the tile between my legs. Tears, I suppose. I pull myself to my feet and stagger to my bed. I've never felt so tired. So depleted. There's so little left of me. My fingers are nothing but knobby bones beneath my pale skin. My limbs are skeletal. Breathing feels like work, and I wonder if I've somehow lost a lung as well. I keep my head turned away from the thing that now stands in the corner. I close my eyes. I sleep. Something is tickling my face. I bring my hand up to scratch my nose. Encounter only two holes in a smooth surface instead. I open my eyes to see a dark shape leaning over me from where it's perched atop my sheets. Limp and greasy hair. My hair dangles down onto my face. I sit up and regard this thing close up for the first time. It's roughly human shaped, small, squat, a slight lean to its posture. My hair is a comically large pile on its tiny head. What I can see of the face that it obscures appears rough hewn, poorly molded, fresh, doughy looking flesh, a much too large nose. Small circular brown stains mark where the eyes should be, and large teeth are pressed into its soft flesh in a parody of a snowman's mouth. Fleshy tiny limbs sprout from its body, each tipped with jagged bitten nails that look huge on the miniature appendages. Who are you? 
I ask it. I don't know where the reply comes from as there is no working mouth. But I hear it all the same. Nobody. Nobody. I angle around it and get out of bed. Walk to the dresser. Pull a photo out from under my socks and underwear. The weather was gorgeous that weekend. And you looked beautiful standing before the lake. The summer sun flaring against your copper hair. Your blue eyes shine. The only eyes that ever really saw me. You would see this. What I've become. Maybe this time I would listen. Now that I can finally see myself. Too late though. I don't blame you for leaving. I never did. I don't blame you, but I miss you so much. A tear falls onto your face, and I thumb it away. I put the photo on top of the dresser. Fish around for the long, ignored bottle of pills at the back of the drawer. I sit back on the bed regarding the bottle. What do I do? I ask the thing that rests beside me on the bed. It turns its head towards me. Release, Release. it says. I open the bottle. Tip it into my hand. Chew, swallow, repeat. I lie back, feel the weight of a tiny body crawl onto my chest. Sleep, sleep, it says. I do. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this week's stories as much as I enjoyed bringing them to life for you. I actually had to brush my teeth three times for that last one. I kept bumping my recorder when I went to spit. For those of you having a tough week, and for those of you who actually listened to the outro, I want to leave you with a little gift. After I sign off, I'm going to play the first part of my latest guided nightmare, the meditation part, before we get to the scares just in case you needed a little deep breathing this week. Speaking of guided nightmares, which are available exclusively on my Patreon, let's do some Patreon shoutouts. This week's beloved patrons are Sam Gosling, Angela Ekstrand, Heather Hughes, Elizabeth Denault, Jen Hayes, Michael Bratinoff, Sarah Zartalamna, Daniel White, Corey Trainer. Cassandra Marie and JB Williams. Oh my god, I really hope I got all those names right. Please forgive me if I didn't. Thank you all so much for your generosity. It really means the world to me. I'm sending you all a big hug over the airwaves and just know that you've done something so kind for someone else. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, Tumblr, and Facebook. You can send all submissions, including for the teen and kid episodes, to scaryyoutosleep at gmail.com. Now, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. Welcome back. I missed you. Thank you for meeting me here. Before we begin... Make sure that you're sitting or lying down in a safe and comfortable space. Have a glass of water or a few sips of tea. If it's chilly, grab a blanket. If it's warm, turn on the fan. Now, lay your head back and close your eyes. First, let's begin breathing deeply, filling up your lungs entirely as you inhale. (sighs) 
breathe out through your mouth. As we breathe together, I want you to know how visible you are, how seen you are here. I see and recognize your feelings, your pain, your worry. We can all feel so invisible or ignored by the world, but you are not invisible. I see you. Remember to keep breathing deeply. Now, let's start relaxing all those tense muscles. If you are able to, stretch those feet, point your toes toward your body. Okay, let them relax. Now, point your toes away from your body. Good. Let them relax. Allow your hips to melt into the cushion you're sitting or lying on. Keep breathing deeply. Let that feeling of melting relaxation travel up your back. Your shoulders are so tense. Give them a gentle roll and then let that tension go. Very gently move your head from side to side, lightly stretching those neck muscles. Bring your head back to the center. Make sure your hands and arms are resting comfortably. Maybe place one of your hands on your upper stomach making sure you can feel those deep, relaxing breaths. <sighs> now, it's time to quiet your mind. It works so hard and deserves some solace as well as your tired body. Now, are you ready to visit my latest creation? <laughs>